wonderful. We are in an amazing series. I've so enjoyed this series, a series we're calling Same God. Come on, somebody say Same God one more time. Oh, I'm so glad that he does not change. He said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what God has done before for our biblical heroes, he can do for us. And so we've gone through the scriptures and studied the word of God and saw how God was with Jacob, saw how God was with Moses and David and Peter and Mary and the things that he did for them, he can do for us. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter four, Ephesians chapter four, verse number four says this. It won't be on your screen today. We're doing things a little different on this one Sunday, but just follow along with me. We are all parts of one body, and we have the same spirit. We all have, and we have all been called to the same glorious future. For there is only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and we all have, listen to this, the same God, the same Father who is over us all and in us all and living through every part of us. However, Christ has given each of us special abilities and special giftings. And whatever he wants us to have out of his rich storehouse of gifts, that's what he gives to us. Today, as we look at God and the same God, my three-point message to you today will actually not be coming from me. And we're not going to look at biblical heroes today. We are going to study some of the heroes in this house today. And we are going to see what God has done in us. And today I have some folks that are going to help me with this message today. And I want them to come. Those who are helping me with the message, I want, I want to invite you to come at this time. Lorene, Ingrid, Jacob, and Amanda. These are my, this is my three-point message today. As I put this together and we thought about Palm Sunday and those many years ago, the crowds gathering, lifting their voice and crying, Hosanna. I thought, boy, I want to hear some voices lifted today in thanks and in praise to the God that doesn't change. Can I just tell you something today, folks? Everybody has a difficult journey. If you're in a difficult part of your journey right now, just continue to allow the Holy Spirit to move you forward. Before you know it, you'll be out of this season. And you'll be able to testify and say that God brought me through. So I've, we prayed about who we might ask today, and these are the folks that I, I reached out to, and they, they just so graciously said, Pastor Steve, yes. They've been in prayer, and they've been in preparation. And today, first of all, I want to introduce to you uh, a young lady that's been in our church not very long, but uh, the Lord brought them during the pandemic of all, of all times, of all seasons. A lot of people were leaving the state, and God's bringing in new people. So, Lorene, I'm so thankful that God brought you and Ken, and you are a godsend to our church. Lorene Tickner, point number one. Are we good? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi, you guys. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Is that my daughter? <laughs> I just love this church. <laughs> okay. I don't understand why Pastor Steve asked me to give a testimony. Since I lived a perfect life. <laughs> okay. All kidding aside. I might have to have this Stella read this. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. This is 
your testimony. Yes. Right? Come up here. Come on, let's, let's encourage Lorene a little bit, everybody. Come here, Mom. You can do this. Yeah, we'll stand with you. Okay. You want her to read it or yeah. you read it? Okay, we're standing here, okay? Okay. All kidding aside, <laughs> don't me say my or her. It's okay. My childhood was very far from perfect. In fact, my childhood consisted of mental and physical abuse as well as abandonment and absolutely no love or affection from her parents whatsoever. The neglect was so bad that while in, uh, still in elementary school, she tried to end her life at least three times that she could remember. One time uh, being taken to the ambulance, uh, to the hospital by ambulance. Around the age of 12, she noticed one of her sisters was praised by her parents for stealing something Desperately wanting the same praise and affection her sister got for stealing, she decided to steal for her parents as well. So she stole for them, and they were happy with her, so she continued to steal whatever they asked her to steal. She stole everything from cigarettes to food to clothing for her parents, but eventually the affection and appreciation stopped. I let my parents know I didn't want to steal anymore, but she was given a guilt trip if she didn't, so she continued to steal for her parents. She eventually started getting caught for stealing. Sometimes the stores, the police would let her go, but three times at the age of 12 to 16, she was taken to juvenile hall. You'd think as a child of the age of 12 to 16 wouldn't enjoy being in juvenile hall, but she actually enjoyed staying there. She had a clean bed with blankets, uh, she wasn't ever hungry. She was given three meals a day. The staff was actually nice to her, like the environment at home. She was thankful to be in juvenile hall and um, was always made the honor girl, meaning she was given extra privileges, such as getting to raid the kitchen and was allowed to tend dances and having first choice to pick out the clothes that were given to the facility. Fast forward to the age of 15, and one of the last times she got out of juvenile hall, she started running away to get away from the abuse at home. She found an older friend that let her live with her, and um, all they did daily was get high. She had no goals, didn't care about herself or her future. At the age of 16, her parent reported her as a runaway, and she was taken back to juvenile hall, then transferred to a youth center where she stayed for six months. Then she was moved into a, fast, a foster home. During this time, she was in juvenile hall, the youth center, and the foster home. She didn't receive one letter or visit from her parent, and she didn't expect one either. She lived in a foster home. She lived in a foster home till she was 18, then she was on her own again. Not having any previous guidance, she didn't know what to do. Thankfully, a family friend allowed her to live in a little trailer that was parked in their driveway. While staying there, knowing she needed to do something with her life, she went to an adult education school and got her GED. Not having much education and knowing she didn't want to live in a little trailer in a driveway all her life, she had, joined, she had planned to join the military. But then she met... Um, her children's father. Soon after meeting him at the age of 19, she was pregnant with her first daughter. Um, eventually, I, she moved in with his family and they were basically forced to get married. At the age of 21, she got pregnant with her second daughter. She was receiving state assistance to help raise her two daughters, which she hated. Her daughters gave her motivation to give them a better life than she had. Starting with, she knew she wanted to leave um, their child's dad because let's just say he had a lot of growing up to do, since, so she divorced him. She went to school part-time and worked part-time. Eventually, at 23, she went to a pre-academy and got a career as a correctional officer. Yeah. Just a little. <laughs> Happy being able to support her girls 
First thing she did was with her first check was buy her three and four year old little girls um, a, a brand new bike. Being able to purchase these bikes for her daughters on her own without financial assistance was a highlight in her life. Working as a correctional officer was hard because all three of her siblings were locked up. Her brother is currently uh, locked up for life. Also, a couple times, one of her older sisters got locked up at the same facility that she worked at. Years later, she found out that that same sister died in a motel from a heroin overdose, and no one in her family told her of her sister's death till years later. Um, her brother being locked up and her sisters being locked up were one of the reasons for quitting this job as a correctional officer. Fast forward again between ages 28 to 38, another failed marriage. I was asked to move out from my ex's um, in-law's home. Um, we rented from, but God saved her and sent her current husband, Ken. After meeting Ken, she eventually moved in with him. As a child, off and on people would talk to her about God. Age 12 was the first time she heard of God. One of her older sisters brought home a little pamphlet that was titled, Somebody Loves Me. She didn't know, but she read this book over and over again. The love, um, the, the love, the, I love, she loved the thought that someone could love her. Besides hearing of God from this pamphlet, also at age 12, she'd get to sleep in her brother's room while he was locked up. She'd fall asleep listening to his radio that was playing oldies at night, and she'd wake up to a pastor preaching about God in the morning. <laughs> Other times she heard of God was during her incarceration in juvenile hall when Christian groups would visit the facility and speak about God to them. She received her first Bible at 16 while attending church with her foster family. Looking back, these are times... It's her Bible. <laughs> Looking back, these are times God was making his presence known to her. While living with Ken, she started feeling con convicted for living with her boyfriend and not being married. At this time, she started going to church, and she'd pray for Ken to come with her. After going to church, Ken started coming with her, and, eventual and they eventually married. We were hearing the, they were hearing the word of God, but their relationship with Christ was not grounded, and that left room for setbacks in the marriage. Um, her oldest daughter, who also fell at a standstill with her relationship with Christ, was on the hunt for a new church. We all attended church together, but none of us were growing in our faith, and this left room for rockiness between the family. She found La Palma Christian Center and loved it from the start, and, in, and invited... <laughs> and invited them to come. We came for one service and fell in love, too. Since, since attending this church, our relationship in Christ has grown, which has caused the relationship among all of us to grow as well. I'd like to thank Almighty God for leading our family to this church. <laughs> these, these are examples of how through Christ, or, or th these are examples of how through this church Christ has strengthened our faith and relationship in Christ. My youngest daughter who suffers from mental illness has volunteered to do things she never thought she'd do despite her mental struggles. And she's so proud of you, Esther. Um, my granddaughter Brielle has been learning Bible verses, Bible stories, learning how to pray and ask and asks for forgiveness on her own. She even shares who God is with her neighborhood friends. <laughs> She's also thank thankful for her son-in-law Brett, who has a great who is a great dad and, and husband, and who makes it possible for my daughter Estella, who is inspired to be out there in the battlefield and invite people to church. She reaches out to, 
to people who some know of God but don't have a relationship with God and to some who don't know much about God. She's invited over 20 people, some who attend the church regularly and some who come off and on. So Estella deals with much spiritual warfare, so please keep her in your prayers. <laughs> Last but not least, for my husband, Ken, he's never had a close relationship with God, and now he does. He's accepted Christ as his Savior and, has, and was even baptized here. <laughs> he has become a, a much better husband, and I can see his eagerness to keep growing in his faith because she has become faithful to Christ. Christ has become faithful to her and to our family. God was always with her. He walked with her during hardships as a child, and I'm thankful to where he has led me now. Yay. You stay right here. I had no idea when I asked her to testify. I didn't know any of that. I didn't know your story and the path of pain. All I know is a woman who's always smiling, who always has a kind word, always encouraging. You would never know, Lorene because of what God did in you. And if he did it before, <laughs> he can do it again. Listen to me. I love you. Karen and I love you. This church loves you. And we're thankful for you. Thank you for allowing God to use your painful past to help us. How many were encouraged with this testimony today? So good. Ah. Thank you. Now she's got a multitask. She's going to take uh, her grandbaby to what? Angel Stadium. There's something going on there. So good. Give it up for Loreen one more time, everybody. Ah, So good. That's just point one of my sermon. Another young lady that God has brought to us that we are so grateful for. So grateful for. A woman of God, clearly, anointed by God, and I believe called by God. There's a calling on your life, Ingrid. You know that. And we are excited to hear your story. This is Ingrid Bustos, everybody. Give it up for point number two. Good morning. Okay. When Pastor Steve asked me to share my story, I answered right away, yes, of course. Then I thought to myself, well, what did I just do? <laughs> For those of you that know me, I'm not one to stand in the spotlight. I don't like all the attention, all eyes on me. But please bear with me today. I step out in faith to share my story for God's glory. I grew up in what seemed to be like a fairly normal household. My parents loved us very much. They both worked to make sure there was always food on the table and gifts under the Christmas tree every single year. We had very big family gatherings quite often. Everyone always seemed to have a great time until someone had too much to drink. Um, and they found a way to ruin it. As I got a little older, I began to realize that my family was not as normal as I thought they were. They were a bit dysfunctional. Arguments between my parents became more constant. The screaming got louder, and the chaos would, make, would wake me in the middle of the night. And as much as I would cover my ears, it was useless. It was just feeding my fears. I felt scared. I felt anxious. I felt confused. I didn't understand what was happening. I started having nightmares very often, but I never told anyone. I didn't look forward to the weekends anymore. I didn't look forward to those family gatherings. I would often ask if I could spend the night at one of my aunt's house because I felt safe in her home. There was none of that chaos there. By sixth or seventh grade, my parents got a divorce. I believe alcohol was at the root of all their problems. 
but only they can speak on that. My mom was a single mom of three kids. There was no co-parenting. Our dad was out of the picture. And soon after, my mom would become more of a friend than a mother to me. Seeing all the brokenness in my home was very painful, and that caused a lot of anger in me, and I began to rebel. I started hanging out with the wrong crowd. I started drinking, smoking, fighting, partying, doing everything I could do to get my mind off of my problems. I could, things seemed fun at the moment, but they didn't bring me joy. Along this road of destruction, I met a guy in high school. A guy that would fill this void that my heart so desperately needed. Five years later, at the age of 19, I became the mother of this amazing boy, Damien. He brought joy back to my life. I spent 11 years in a relationship with the father of my son. Half of those years seemed good and the other half were definitely not. At least that's what I told myself. I had never been exposed to a healthy relationship. In ours, there was a lot of hurt, there was betrayal, and there was even a lot of abuse. I never told anyone. We had gotten so good at pretending, pretending that everything was fine, pretending that we were okay. From an early age, I had learned to hold everything in. In my eyes, no one around me was capable of helping me. Most of the people I knew had problems of their own, and I thought to myself, if they can't help me, if they can't help themselves, how in the world are they going to help me? Our problems continued, and the fighting was very constant. I was doing everything I said I would not do. I was copying the behavior of those that loved me, but yet they wounded me. I didn't want to do the same thing to my son. So I tried to end the relationship, but I couldn't. He wouldn't let me. I was threatened, so I stayed. I stayed out of fear, but I was miserable. I was struggling with anxiety, and I found myself constantly sick, constantly getting ill from different things. It was the fear, it was the anxiety, it was the anger inside. During those moments and during those times, the enemy began to deceive me. He began to feed me lies and I believed every single one of them. He told me I was helpless. He told me I was not worthy. He told me that no one would ever save me, that I was better off dead, that everything was happening <clears throat> to me as a consequence of all the wrong and bad choices I had made, that I deserved to suffer, and that is what I did. I suffered in silence. Again, never telling anybody. Drinking and smoking to numb the pain, to forget my ugly truth. My heart was full of hate. My heart had turned cold, and I was hardened. I became very, very, very bitter, rude, prideful, arrogant. I was just mean. My walls came up. I was defensive, and I was defensive with all the wrong people. I wasn't allowing anybody else to come in. Why? People that loved you hurt you. I didn't like who I had become. In the middle of my brokenness, I began to pray. I began to cry out to God. I needed him to save me. I needed him to rescue me because I was dying on the inside. And I needed him to come quickly because I was afraid of staying like this. I didn't want to go on with my life like this. I didn't want it to look this way. I knew of God because my mom would attend mass whenever she could and I would go with her. I knew God existed, but I assumed that he was far. All I knew was that he wanted me to do good and to be a good person. That was all I knew. Yet, that was enough for me to continue to pray to him every single night. And he heard my prayers. He heard my cry. He saw me, and he gave me courage and strength to leave this man. It was not easy. It was not easy, and I lived having to constantly look over my shoulder for a couple of years. But God protected me, and he protected my son. He always provided. God didn't fail me. It wasn't in my plans to raise my child alone. 
I didn't know how I would do it. The only thing I was sure of was that I wanted better for him. I wanted better than what I was given. I wanted to show him that him and I could be happy alone, that a good life was possible, and that love was attainable in our home. I started thinking about going back to church, but not the kind of church I grew up going to. I remember back to my childhood that there was a bus that would come to our street and take us to church. I must have just gone a handful of times, but those times were enough. They were enough to show me that these people, these strangers that didn't know me, they cared. They made learning fun and they were loving. They didn't know me <clears throat> and yet they loved me. Something in my heart kept telling me, there has to be more. There has to be more than what you think you know, Ingrid. You need to know God fully and your son needs to know him too. A couple months later, later after God would bring a loving family into my life. She invited me to her son's baptism at family church. I was hesitant to go at first because I didn't know what to expect. I knew it'd be, it would be very different from what I knew, but I still wanted it. I wanted it for my son and I, and I'm thankful for that invitation. As soon as worship began, it was as if every single lyric was for me. As soon as the pastor began to speak, it was as if every word was just for me. One Sunday was all it took. I would give my life to Jesus a few months later. And a few months after, I was baptized. When baptisms were announced, I was like, I'm not ready. I felt I was never ready. I thought my life was too messy. I thought I had to get it together. I thought all the people in church always looked so perfect. Everybody looked so well put together. Nobody's struggling. Nobody is battling. Nobody has challenges. Nobody has problems. Nobody has issues like me. But we all do. They differ, but we do. And just as Claudia said, we don't have to be ready. Yeah. We will never be fully ready. And I'm thankful that God continued to stir something in my heart and that I allowed him. Most, a lot of my family members were not okay with me being baptized and becoming a Christian. I lost people who I thought were my friends because I no longer wanted to live a life of destruction. People would make smart remarks and comments because I wanted to be different because I wanted change. I didn't have a problem with that. As you can tell, I was used to doing things my way. I didn't care what anybody else had to say. And this was gonna be something good, something for the good for my son and I. I had finally found what I had been searching for. And I would not allow anyone to take that away from me. Everything had already been taken away from me. I had lost all the confidence in myself. I had lost my identity, but now I found it. I found it in Christ. I found it in the only one who matters, and I put it there, and I never allowed anybody else to take that from me. I found my good father. I found my protector. I found true love. I found forgiveness for all of my sins. It was his kindness that led me to repentance. God gave me a new heart. He removed my heart of stone and gave me a heart of flesh. I had to experience brokenness to find restoration in him. I had to experience chaos to receive his perfect peace. I had to experience woundedness to receive the power of his healing. Because times and time does not heal, only our God heals. If I had not been in darkness, I wouldn't have known how desperately I needed his light. And at my weakest, I was giving his strength. No matter how many times I failed God, he never failed me. And looking back now, I know he was always with me. He was with me all along. I wouldn't be here standing in front of you to tell it if it wasn't so. And I'm just gonna read a Psalm if I may. Yeah. 
So I'm reading Psalm 116, 1 through 9. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unweary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. So good. Hang on a minute, Ingrid. Thank you. Thank you for not allowing the enemy to keep you stuck. You know, we've all been hurt. And part of the process is to find healing. And you've been on a healing journey. <laughs> She's on a healing journey. And in fact, she has her healing journey family here supporting her. And I know you have to be proud. You have to be proud of her. Uh, there's a class called Healing Journey that Ingrid has been a part of. And uh, many of it's a, a ladies only class. Casey Bailey has taught this for how many weeks? 29 weeks these ladies have been doing this. But we're going to do it again in September, I think, and it's going to keep growing, and more people are going to be healed in Jesus' name. Thank Ingrid one more time. Wasn't that awesome? So good. And I'm excited to now have point three. Um, I, I've, I've known these guys for a long, long time. Amanda, I've known you since you were just a little girl. Yeah. And um, we're so glad that God brought you back to our house. You've always been a part of our family, but we're glad that you're really plugged in here and part of the, part of the church family. And so Jacob and Amanda Mize are coming now, and they are going to conclude our sermon today. Love you guys. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Um, yeah, my name is Jacob, and this is my wife, Amanda. I'm trying, I'm trying to decide if I should pull this out or... Yes, you should. Okay, I'll hold it. Okay. <clears throat> So my name is Amanda. I've been coming to La Palma Christian Center with my family uh, for about 20 years or more. Um, my parents are Stacy and Cheryl Trotter. I call Stacy Trotter Pops uh, because while he has raised me as his own, um, and I call him my dad, his daughter's my sister, um, I'm very grateful he came into mine and my brother's lives. He is not my biological dad. So for the context of my testimony, when I say dad, I am talking about my biological dad, not Stacy Trotter, just <laughs> Let's get this out here now. Um, so, my mom and dad, they divorced when I was nine years old. And when this happened, my dad changed as a person. He fell into a deep depression. Um, he became really reclusive and he became addicted to drugs, uh, specifically meth. And when my younger brothers and I would stay at his house, we actually wouldn't see him for days. He would sleep, um, he wouldn't really take care of us. We didn't eat, we didn't bathe, uh, we didn't go to school on those days. Um, but when we did see him, he was really, really angry or sad uh, and it was all very confusing. Um, people were always in and out of our house that we didn't know. We were robbed one night. Um, I saw a lot of things that I shouldn't have seen and I took care of my brothers on my own. Uh, my mom eventually gained full custody of us and my dad went to jail for something unrelated, um, but then I didn't see him again for a, a very long period of time. And although my childhood tumultuous as Amanda. I had a lot of things that I grew up around and, and experiences that shaped me and formed me in a way that I think just set us up for a difficult time when we got married, you know, um, an inability to set expectations and I think just some other things that just really, as you see, we'll see, uh, really hurt our marriage. Right. So we got married in May 2017 after dating for seven years. So we had been dating since high school. And I told my mom, we've been together for so long, this is going to be a piece of cake. And my mom laughed at me. <laughs> um, and Cheryl, if you're listening, unfortunately, your laughter was merited because it was only a few weeks of marriage. 
um, that we started to fight a lot. And, you know, we dated for seven or eight years before we got married. Um, and so we thought, oh, yeah, this will be, this will be a cakewalk. Um, but uh, pretty quickly into our marriage, we started fighting about really everything, money, how we would spend our time, workload, who would do what, our, the vision for the future. Um, and basically, very quickly on, I had to get two jobs, and Amanda started dealing with some struggles of her own. Right. So um, I bring up my childhood at the very beginning because in late 2017, six months after we'd gotten married, um, I started going to therapy and was diagnosed with depression, anxiety disorder, and something called complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And a lot of that is due to my childhood experiences of living with my biological dad. Um, I couldn't leave our apartment. I would cry all day. I would sleep all day. I felt very alone. And then I found out through therapy that the huge change of getting married and leaving my mom and pops' house was a shock to my system and my mental health. Um, uh, and then soon after this, my mom was actually diagnosed with cancer, and we had no immediate answers surrounding her illness, and so I spiraled even further. Um, I couldn't imagine continuing to live in that pit of despair that I was in. And we were both exhausted, and we were both frustrated, and we were both disconnected, and um, we, we were basically roommates. We didn't connect spiritually, mentally, emotionally, um, and we felt so alone and we were fighting and, and mm -hmm. even more kind of just perpetuated this alone feeling. Right. And then we got pregnant. <laughs> it was all better. Everything got right. fixed. Then we got pregnant. Um, we were not planning on getting pregnant. It wasn't part of our plans. We were on birth control. We weren't even sure that we ever wanted kids and we had never talked about it seriously. Um, I decided to take a pregnancy test from the Dollar Tree on a whim before I started uh, a month of birth control pills and it said I was pregnant. Um, so then we made a doctor's appointment and I was actually almost three months pregnant. <laughs> um, so after I gave birth in 2018, we were in survival mode. A lot of that stuff had not been uh, addressed. A lot of my mental health struggles hadn't been addressed. Jacob being exhausted from carrying the burden, the financial burden and working two jobs, um, a lot of that hadn't been addressed at all. Um, then with a the newborn, it was much harder than we thought it would be. Um, Sloan did not sleep through the night until she was 18 months old. And I thought that it was because I was doing something wrong. I wasn't feeding her enough. Um, and I made it my fault that she didn't do what I thought babies should do. I had postpartum depression and anxiety along with all of the other things that I already struggle with in my mental health. I would cry if somebody asked to hold Sloan and I insisted on doing everything on my own. Um, I pushed my body and my mental health to the limit trying to breastfeed her. I did it longer than I should have. Um, I had her all day while Jacob worked uh, two jobs and um, I worked from home, I went to school, I cleaned, I made everyone's meals, um, and we both felt very unappreciated by the other. Um, I questioned Jacob often, uh, why don't you see what I'm doing for you? But he had the same questions for me. Why don't you see what I'm doing for you and our family? I'm working two jobs. But we were both so wrapped up in our own experience, we refused to see the other. Um, there was a lack of empathy and understanding. Um, then we had to move back in with my parents. I love them a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it was a blessing, but it was hard hard on our marriage. <laughs> um, in all areas, we felt like everything we did on a day-to-day -day wasn't enough uh, for each other or enough to survive. Yeah, and things really came to a head. It was September 2019, and I think all of this stuff had just kind of culminated in this peak, right? And, you know, we, we had unmet expectations, like I mentioned earlier. We didn't communicate properly. We didn't ask for what we needed. We didn't even know what we needed. Behavior um, to one another, and um, hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Hello. Right here? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Great. Um, and uh, dramatic pause because eventually we we decided we thought we were gonna split, call it quits, and right. after only you know I think two years of marriage probably, and so I stayed a night at my brother's house and I slept on the floor, and we really just were like, I think this is reached its course. Right, yeah. I couldn't go to his parents' house without getting upset and thinking that these people wouldn't be my family anymore. Um, I was very upset thinking about Sloan having to split her time between us. Um, then, uh, in one of my lowest points, I came to La Palma. <laughs> 
after not being here for years. Um, and I came by myself, and Pastor Steve said, you know, if, if anybody's having marriage troubles, come to the front. And so I responded. And at that point, I was not very comfortable being vulnerable within the church. So for me at that time, it was a big deal for me to respond. Um, and I, I did. I responded, and I cried, and then I pulled Karen aside, and I was like, okay, Miss Karen, I need to meet with you and pastors. Like, something needs to happen, and I feel like what we need to do is, is first meet with you all, get your counsel. Um, and they, w- when we did meet with them, they encouraged us to go to marriage counseling. And they, and they encouraged us to go to the, the Christian counselor that they've recommended a lot of people to. And I was immediately like, oh, man, I don't want to do this. Like, if they just tell me to, like, pray and read the Bible, like, I'm, I'm not paying $150 for that. <laughs> and, and, and in a lot of ways, I was frustrated with God because I had been doing that. We've been in ministry in our whole lives. We've been in church our whole lives. We've been saved since we were children. And so... I felt like, oh, well, if God was going to do something, he'd do it by now, and he hasn't, so I don't really know what's going to, what's going to change now. Um, and although I, you know, I, I felt like, uh, you know, I know that God is sufficient to fix this, I, I felt like, I don't know if just praying and reading the Bible doesn't feel like it's enough. And, and I, I think in, in some ways it obviously is enough, but in other ways I think the, the piece that I was missing was this community, was, this, was, was um, God working through other people, God pouring into my life through other people, other, other you know, spirit-filled people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, also, side note. This wasn't planned, but we've been to other churches, and I feel like we hear it a lot on Sunday mornings, but truly, this is one of the few churches that I've been to that actually promotes ministry, altar time, and togetherness, community. Um, I was telling Jacob that I love Pastor Steve. If somebody comes up for prayer and they're a young person, you call other young people to come and pray for them, or women, uh, women who are pregnant or whatever else, and um, it builds community. It's very unifying and uplifting, um, and you can get that here in church, right? Okay. <laughs> a little commercial there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Back to marriage counseling. Um, <laughs> so we go, we go three times a month, especially when things seem good. Um, the same way that we approach hard situations prayed up, right? You know you're about to go into a situation that's difficult. You pray a whole bunch and you make sure that the Holy Spirit's moving through you already before you get there. We do that with marriage counseling. We go to, uh, we approach hard situations um, with the tools that we've learned in marriage counseling. Um, We learn to approach misunderstandings with kindness and understanding um, instead of our personal responses of defensiveness and judgment. Yeah, and and one of the other things that I think has been so critical for our marriage is just being vulnerable. I mean, this, I mean, the very act of being up here is, it's it's vulnerable, right? And so I think that us having to admit that we didn't have all the answers and, and we couldn't do this alone, I think was a really big shift for our marriage. Um, and I also feel like, you know, there's also this, like, kind of this notion, you know, that's kind of prevalent that it says, like, oh, as a man, you've got to be strong. And, you know, you work two jobs and you make the money and, and you come home and, and you don't need the emotional support or you don't need the praise for everything you're doing. And um, unfortunately for me, I do. <laughs> I do need the thank you. I do yeah. need that. And that's not bad. Me, right. me being vulnerable and saying, oh, I would love for you to say thank you or I'd love for you to you know, say a kind word or whatever. Right. Um, I'm fine with that now, and I used to not be, and I think that that's the mm-hmm. result of, you know, the counseling that we've done and that kind of thing. Right, yeah, needing attention um, from somebody that you love is not an embarrassing thing. It's okay to ask for it, but we must be mindful enough to understand what our emotional need is and then be vulnerable enough to just ask for it. Sometimes it sounds silly, but I've had to learn to be vulnerable and tell Jacob, like, I feel really insecure about myself today, so I need you to be extra nice. Or I'm struggling with my mental health today. I need you to approach me with caution and maybe treat me like a baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you have to know what you need and then be okay with asking for it. Yeah. And so kind of in conclusion, when, when Pastor Steve, you know, called me and asked me to, to share this and you know, I brought Amanda in, I was like, I don't do this alone. Um, and I uh, was thinking about it. I was like, well, I don't really know how God, like, did this, right? Not that I think that, like, I... I did this by myself or by any means, but I, it was hard for me at first, you know, because we're still kind of in it. Like, we're still, yeah. you know, only two years of, like, really rebuilding this thing, right? And so 
um, I just I wasn't initially sure. I couldn't point very easily to the thing that I was like, oh, this is this is where God really intervened, and and it really took this process of writing this out and and, and you know creating this that I, I realized that God was through the whole thing from Sloane being born to right. um, you know her Amanda coming to you know um, uh, La Palma that one Sunday, and then even I, I, again we didn't share this, but uh, we came back and then um, it was like testimony week like that <laughs> month. And it was like, broken marriage, broken marriage, broken marriage. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is tough. <laughs> it was rough. Um, it was, it was a know, hard thing to sit through. <laughs> yeah. But all that to say, but God, right? Um, he, he was there through all of it. And, right. and I think that, you know, the same God who was there in our, in our darkest moments, the same God who was there um, when we were crying out for help, and, you know, the same God who was, who was there when I, I just didn't know how I was going to make it through is the same God that took us through that whole time and, is, is, is working through us now, and, you know, our marriage is by no means perfect, um, right. but we know that God is with us. We know that we have community here. And Yeah, uh, yeah, so just when I found out I was pregnant, I was, I literally was like, God, why? <laughs> you made this happen because <laughs> I did everything I should have done so that it wouldn't happen, um, but God made sure that it happened, um, but I believe that even then, he was working in a way that I couldn't see. Um, a lot of our initial motivation to work through our issues, um, go to marriage and fight for our account, fight for our marriage, was Sloan, um, our daughter. I truly believe that God knew what he was doing, and he knew that we would see Sloan as a motivator to fight for our marriage. Um, we've refocused, and uh, we now look forward to seeing each other, helping each other, recognizing each other, being vulnerable with each other, helping each other, showing love and kindness to each other. Um, and now it's not because of Sloan. Um, it's because we've learned to appreciate the way that God has wired each of us, even the things that we don't understand. Yeah. Love it. So good. So good. And you wouldn't think that, you know, a young couple like this would be struggling with marriage, but... There's a, there's a real enemy that wants to destroy his, the, the job of the enemy. He's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have abundant life. Thank you for being vulnerable. It takes vulnerability to kind of peek behind the curtain, you know, um, and I, I, I'm grateful. I'm very grateful. Your testimony today has encouraged us because what God has done for you, what God has done for them, God can do for us because He is the same God. So thank you. Let's thank our, our uh, my sermon points today. You guys can take a seat. Thank you so much. For those who are watching Perhaps listening, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you.